Um, so let me kick it off while they get it sorted out. Um, I'm, I'm Nicholas Stone, founder and CEO of Bluestone Lane, originally from Melbourne in Australia. I moved to the States in 2010. And uh, I think I might start with, uh, with one of the themes that uh, I spoke about when I presented two years ago, which was that uh, I was probably like the least or the most inexperienced person in the sort of coffee and hospitality space in the entire CEO forum. And I'm probably still remain so uh, to this day. Um, prior to launching Bluestone Lane in 2013, I'd never worked a day in hospitality. Uh, I'd never, certainly never worked in a coffee shop and uh, didn't and still don't really know how to make perfect uh, coffee. Um, and I really was purely a customer. And I was a customer that had very much an unfulfilled need. And Bluestone Lane really started as an idea in business school about essentially trying to export what I believe Australia does better than anyone, which is really this, this fourth wave, um, which is the, the merging of both premium and unrelenting focus on quality coffee and tea, but the food element, the service, the curated environments and the aesthetic, and ultimately what I think is the most important thing, particularly talking about some of the challenges and, and trends and the pace of change and loneliness, depression, isolation, instant gratification, addiction, um, is really about the human connection. And that in Australia, I think they do it better than anyone, which is localise their customer base. They don't have customers, they have locals. Um, <clears throat> so let's, let's go into Bluestone for those of you that... Is there any way we can reduce the... Yeah, it's a bit hard to see. <clears throat> I'll keep going. So Bluestone Lane launched in, in 2013 and it was really focused on a hole in the wall, um, primarily coffee led, amenity based, premium, hole in the wall shop. And it was very close to where I worked in, in banking. Uh, it was one block away. And the whole premise there was really to position to the landlord that um, they're under some, they have some structural headwinds that are pretty unrelenting everything from technology, meaning that you don't need, tenants don't need to take as much office space, the, the revolution of shared workspace, uh, flexible working conditions, uh, and just the fact that millennials are looking for a more balanced day, uh, whether that's exercise, yoga, mindfulness, healthy eating, quality eating, just time out. Um, the premise was where you could build them a bin or uh, a gym, five to 10,000 square feet, or you can build a coffee shop 500 square feet or 300 in the case of our first store. It's very accessible and open and it can be a, a, a truly in-demand amenity for a millennial and younger professional uh, tenant. So from there, we, we had this first, I'd say, two phases of our business. The first phase was very much from 2013 to 2016. We got to 12 stores. I was still working in banking, so this is my part-time job. Um, we had a, a team, no corporate staff or one corporate staff, a small team, and uh, you know we, we did a pretty good job with the first 12 stores. Um, most of them were incredibly financially successful, and we were able to get to 12 with less than two million dollars. Quite rare, and and quite different from a lot of the approaches that I see in in the independent coffee world. Um, probably spending way too much and have no idea on their cost structure. Um, from there, I went actually full time in June 2016. So we went from 12 uh, in June 2016 to the position we're in now, which is 33. Um, we will be at 55, 60 stores by the end of next year. We're currently in six markets, uh, and the new markets that we're going to are Houston, Austin, uh, Boston, Miami, and Toronto. We offer, um, I would say, two formulas. One is a coffee shop model, which has a more refined uh, food proposition, anchored around tea and coffee pastries, grab and go, our toast bar. And then we have our more expansive proposition, which is in cafes. And we've now extended that beyond just daytime cafes to now nighttime, so servicing three day parts. It's challenging, we're not doing it perfectly. Uh, we're learning, but we're not gonna give it up. And that's, we've debuted that with our store in Venice on Rose Avenue on the Upper West Side. We're going to do it in a West Hollywood cafe that opens tomorrow morning. 
and uh, we'll be looking to do that in all the new cities in which we're entering. Another big part of the business that's going to launch next year is on the product side. So we call retail coffee shops and cafes, and we call uh, product everything that we sell through primarily CPG type channels. Uh, I think there's tremendous opportunity there. I think sometimes it's overstated, and I think the transaction sort of multiples are a little bit frothy, uh, but it is going to be real, and I do think that technology and buying behaviour is changing so significantly that more and more people are going to be, uh, and if you look at the stats on Amazon, Amazon in the grocery category, coffee's number one seller. It's just, uh, what's quite interesting is if you look at the top five items being purchased from Amazon in the coffee space, they're all capsules, um, which is a fact that not many people really take notice of, um, but we certainly are. Um, so this is sort of the sales growth of the Bluestone Lane. So this year we'll grow about 120%. Next year we forecast to grow another 100%. So we're really just calling doubling the business over the next four or five years. It's actually, it seems a lot in the space of boutique, sort of super premium, but it's not really. Um, it's actually very slow when you, I'm sure that you all took note of the, uh, the looking brands that they opened 525 stores in nine months. And the fact that Starbucks has opened three stores a day since inception. Um, we take, we've, we've taken so much uh, from educating ourselves and delving really deeply into the success of Starbucks. Um, in Australia, Starbucks has such a, people have such a closed view on it. So my IP, Starbucks was a market in which, Australia is a market in which Starbucks failed. The same with Israel and didn't even really attempt Italy. Um, they're really coming back in at a rate of knots into the Australian market off the back of mass student primarily migration from Asia. Uh, so they're, they're dominating shopping malls and, and where you've got clusters of student populations because they have such a brand you know, affinity. But um, you know, that's always I found so fascinating in this space that people think that, hey, you go from five stores to ten, oh, that's commercial, or you're selling out. I, I think that's just absolutely absurd when you think about how big the market is, how big the TAM is, and uh, the Starbucks has 27,000 stores. And in fact, uh, if you read Schultz's Pour Your Heart Into It, which is really our bible at Bluestone, <laughs> I think that and, that and Shoe Dog and maybe setting, it, setting the Table by Danny Meyer, but very much pouring your heart into it. It's about the first 10 years of Starbucks, and I think that you think about fourth wave, it's no doubt in my mind that Schultz designed Starbucks to be a fourth wave enterprise for the first 10 years. It just was so bloody successful <laughs> that, that they decided to scale it to a $100 billion company. And the fact that it, it, it became a $100 billion company with real revenue, real cash flow, not just like inflated tech valuations within 30 years is absolutely extraordinary. <clears throat> so this sort of shows just the rate of growth, look at the employees, so 165, uh, you know, 170 in start of 2017, now we're at 500. That's providing extraordinary challenges on the business. Um, I'll talk a bit about that later, and I'm sure you're all seeing it, but I don't think that this is gaining easier. I think the, the war for talent is not just a war between other competitors or peers in the space. It's a war for opportunity cost, and I think that opportunity cost is accelerating, and it is going to drive tremendous automation, tremendous robotics in this space, because the cost structure and the ability to pass on pricing power is going to be limited with the emergence of McDonald's and their McCafe model and even what Duncan Brands and Starbucks are going to do, where they have massive scale advantages. <coughs> Just to show sort of the pace of change and how brands grow, this is our website referral. So you can see our sessions you know, in November 2016, 20,000, we're nearly at 1,000 sessions a month, 100,000 sessions a month, sorry. Um, but it's sort of in line with our revenue growth and in line with our employee growth naturally. Um, so this topic's really about trying to bring boutique uh, at scale to life. And what's fascinating is I don't think there's anyone who's an expert at trying to, who's achieved it or knows how to achieve it. Blue Bottle are the biggest and I don't think they know how to do it. Um, we certainly don't. Uh, we've just got signals along the way that we're trying to. But I think we all recognise that there is a need, definitely a need for a, for a few brands that are very dominant in the US or 
globally. Um, and I do feel that if someone in the US is not going to do it, and someone from Asia will. Um, how I define boutique at scale, <clears throat> it's really focused about the aggregation of all the elements that go into a premium coffee experience or a specialty coffee experience and just doing everything slightly better. I don't think it's just one thing. I think it's just incremental improvement across all these different elements. So product slightly better, food slightly better, environment slightly better, service slightly better, localization, personalization slightly better. And that together creates this perception that, oh, it's really boutique and really special. I, I don't think it's like one transformative thing. And in fact, like in hospitality, full stop, transformative growth and change doesn't really exist. And that's because hospitality really has no intellectual property. It's a service-based, localised industry, uh, which, which provides tremendous opportunity in a world in which we're becoming more addicted and isolated and focused on, on digital environments. If I think about, for us, we define it very simply. Premium, consistent, coffee, tea and food, service, personalised, that notion of local reciprocity. What that means is like, we want to know your name, face and order, and we want our locals to know our staff. That actually is a perfectly reciprocal relationship that helps retention, helps purpose uh, for our staff, but obviously drives greater loyalty. And the most important thing in coffee, with, undoubtedly, is you have to be in a, a customer retention fo focused business. You cannot make money, you cannot be sustainable in a, in a customer acquisition model. Um, Curated environments, I think you see a big difference between, we get benchmarked a lot with Blue Bottle because maybe we're, we're, we've got blue in our name or we're a similar size, but you know, Blue Bottle's got an approach that they want all their stores to look the same. Blue Stone has a different approach. We, we like all our stores to be curated. We have elements that tie them together, material palette and, and uh, colours. But uh, we really feel it, and that's a very Australian-centric thing because even though one guy, one gentleman may own 10 cafes or 15 cafes, they'll all be different names and different looks. We want to sort of, we shaped it for the US consumer where we still keep that independence and, and curation and individual sort of bespoke nature, but they are tied together. <coughs> I think personalization, such a big trend. If you look at class fitness, I think it's such a great example. Class fitness has existed for 30 years, but suddenly like SoulCycle is the most successful class fitness brand in the world. Um, People aren't going for the workout, right? You could actually get greater workout or greater utility in other ways, but they're going for the community. They're going for the daily ritual, and that's what I truly believe um, is going to continue to accelerate in the US, and that's the opportunity. That's the way it is in Australia. Take me, for example. I was an investment banker and uh, working big hours, and what I looked forward to every day, twice a day, was walking into my local and then making me feel good, right? Knowing me, recognising me. It's like. And, and what, one of the most profound things when I moved to the States in 2010 is like people have these relationships with their dry cleaner. Well, this is a very New York centric view, but with their dry cleaner and like their nail and you know, Manny and Petty service provider and maybe their, maybe their local bar, but they didn't have, have it with coffee. Coffee was just like commodity, it was just transactional. It was just, yeah, just get a coffee. But that's very different in Australia, and obviously that, that's accelerating, and, and that boutique game is tying into that. Um, Uniformity is the most important thing uh, for, to be able to scale a brand. There is no brand if one store is great, one store is mediocre, if one store has fast, you know, convenient, speedy, quality coffee and one doesn't, one makes food taste great and one, one doesn't. That's not a brand. That's just then an aggregation or a collection of stores that is unsustainable as well. I think it's particularly unsustainable right now because the cost structure and the investment required to be boutique is so much higher than if you wanted to play cost leadership and just franchise or just do mass, ra um, mass rollout with fully automatic, mach automatic machines and remove the service element, which is undoubtedly what we're going to see in the next two years. And I think it's, hit, it's going to hit the, the fast casual brands first and um, the rise of Cloud Kitchen, the rise of Eatsa, and oh, I think you'll see dramatically what Sweetgreen, Carver, and some of these brands are gonna do to pivot, to remove and reduce the human capital intensity in that business when the local doesn't value it anymore. It values convenience and quality rather than any type of service engagement. 
So sector activity, Jeff sort of talked about, um, Jeffrey talked about this, but you know, it's just phenomenal, right? And there's a reason being, it's because the cost pressures are rising, the opportunity is huge, the customers, uh, the democratization of information, the customer education, the customer demand, um, the need for brands to be aspirational and relevant for millennials is, is driving all this mass movement. Um, if you're not, I think Jeff, Jeffrey's right, the biggest risk is not doing anything and that's what they're getting up you know, in front of it and sometimes they have to pay up very quickly uh, because coffee has stood the test of time and it is a massive tamp. Uh, you know, I, when I look at the Blue Bottle Nestle deal, my personal opinion was that Nestle probably panicked and thought JAB was going to buy Blue Bottle as well. So they threw this huge number down. I don't know, it's well, in, well north of 10 times revenue, probably close to 13 times revenue, like a true tech valuation. Um, and, you know, I, I think that there's going to be more of this because it is an incredibly lucrative category. And if you look at, if Nestle's restructured their entire food product mix and they've removed all of confectionery, and what are the two fastest growth areas? Water and coffee. So I, I think you're gonna see continued acceleration and the fact that no one has achieved boutique at scale means that there's definitely gonna be continued aggregation of, of smaller brands. <coughs> some of the transactions, in addition to the sales, like just the amount of capital being raised by some of these groups. I mean, we saw um, Bill's raise 45 million from TPG. Now, like, that's extraordinary that TPG would be investing in a business of the size of Phil's, but obviously the growth potential is there. The gross profit in coffee and tea, tea even more so, is extremely high relative to most other food groups um, or beverage groups. Um, you've got tremendous pressure with the the dominant soft drink brands, right? They've had, they're having declines that they probably never ever anticipated. Um, they've been diversifying over the last 10 years, but the, the pace of change is accelerating. The, the rise of sparkling water, the rise of, of all different types of, sort of waters is quite unrelenting. In addition, you've got tremendous pressure in the alcohol space. Millennials drink less alcohol than the past four demographic clusters. And what's accelerating the decline in alcohol consumption is the fact that the dinner part of hospitality is being absolutely savaged by delivery. Right? It's been savaged by delivery, the fact that it's too expensive, the fact that it takes too long, the fact that it's linked to alcohol, and alcohol and the fact that people don't even want to go to venues where they don't feel like they want to drink and there's applied peer pressure, whether it's actual or, or subconscious, the fact of even splitting a bill with those who are drinking and those who are not is turning people off. Um, there's going to be some huge changes in the, with the big alcohol guys, I've got no doubt. The fact that they haven't bought anyone in coffee is very surprising to me, but no doubt that they're, they're looking on how to do it, whether it's through inorganic or organic means, but it's going to continue. Oh, the one thing that I should have mentioned, and you've probably read it, that Bluestone Lane did take on um, a significant amount of capital in June this year from RSC Ventures, which is Stephen Ross and, and Matt Higgins. Um, Stephen, probably one of the US best entrepreneurs, um, without a doubt, <coughs> one of the best brand builders. He deeply understands uh, and respects the customer segment that we're focused on, which is millennial, Gen Z, primarily in our case, like our core customer is young professional female. I can talk about why, why that's the case for ours, but <coughs> uh, related, which is you know, Stephen's uh, company uh, is the largest landlord outside of Columbia and um, NYU. They also own Equinox, the largest luxury gym brand in the world, Soul Cycle. They've got tremendous investments in a whole lot, number of other classes. RSC um, own, or the significant owner in Mamafuku, Milk Bar and Pizza, Bluestone, and then you've got the meat, every, everyone in the media space from Vayner to Deris PR, and they've got some really interesting investments like the Drone Racing League. Um, so 
Why it was compelling for us is because they understood the exact customer that we're focused on. And they understand the need to innovate on the product side, on the service base, and into integrate technology into everything that we're doing. So if we have a look at benchmarking store growth, and um, I think this is quite interesting. So again, when you're talking boutique at scale, like scale in my eyes is probably a thousand stores, especially when Starbucks has 15,000 in the US. So there's, there's literally no one who's even close. Like, and the, the rate of growth is so slow, that'll never happen. So I think for us, like we are assessing if we can open 30 stores next year, and if we can, and the, we can keep the brand at the position it is currently, then I think I've got a lot of confidence to go, okay, it's time to do 200 stores a year or 100 stores a year. Um, so next year is a pivotal year for us. If we see that we can't do it and it's really wobbly, then we'll probably have to really uh, assess the, the value proposition and, and if we can do it, and maybe it's better to give it to a partner to do. Um, so that's what we're considering. So Bluestone Lane's probably the youngest out of all these guys. And, um, you know, really, as I said, there's the two phases, but since I joined, we went from 12 to now 33 in two years. And uh, we're the fastest growing. Um, I think you can see that from the slide. And what's fascinating is like some of the big guys who got to some you know, semblance of, of uh, core critical mass have stopped really growing. Um, Black Alom has really stagnated. Um, Bill's really stagnant. Blue Bottle's the one that's been growing quite you know, quickly. Um, there's no one else. Uh, which is extraordinary, extraordinary, and I'm not, and I think there's a reason why, and the, the reason why is that the pressures on the labour side are so much more significant than people realise until you start operating. <laughs> uh, but <clears throat> for us, we want to finish next year at, at 60, and we've got a real, realistic chance to be the biggest, and we will have done it with probably one quarter of the capital that Blue Bottle raised prior to being sold. Uh, one third the capital that Phil's has raised. So I'm a big believer in managing costs and, and focused on return on invested capital and running a low capital, you know, a capital efficient business. And I guess that's because my background was in business and in advising companies on how to grow and prosper and how to understand value propositions and build brands, not necessarily in hospitality. And there's a terrific article that Malcolm Gladwell, who's actually a local at Bluestone Lane, um, wrote in Entrepreneur Magazine two months ago. And he's talked about entrepreneurs and he's done some big regression and study about what underpins the success of an entrepreneur. And he said essentially it comes down to be more successful entrepreneurs come from what he defines as outsiders. Outsider means someone who has an unfulfilled need that has no, and as a customer, but has no experience in, in the industry whatsoever. So they think without any rules, they don't listen to any norms, they don't take advice from people, they just do it. Think a doer, Steve Jobs. Or it's a third or fourth generation family business where the, the upstart says, hey, we're not in coal anymore, we're gonna go into solar. Uh, I'd really encourage you to read the article, um, quite fascinating. <clears throat> you can sort of see the growth there. I'm, I'm, this, this really is uh, some of our views and then you know, playing around with the Morgan Stanley report that they did you know, earlier this year or last year. But yeah, certainly it seems that um, those who get a bit more scale have got significant advantages over a new, new uh, independent. And I think the reason being is there's so many costs at, um, at the smallest sort of, if you, if you move from being purely oper owner operator where one person's running the whole store, I think it can be very profitable and that person can make you know, a good income, but like going for two to three is extremely challenging because millennials, just like everyone, wants health insurance. Um, minimum wage increases now to $15 in New York from January 1st. People want paid leave. People want flexibility, they want mastery, they want autonomy. And it's hard to provide those things unless you're growing quite significantly. 
So my advice, and I get asked all the time on this front about, like, should I start a coffee business? And my honest view is, if you really love working with people and you want to be associated with people all the time and every day, then you could do one. But don't think that one, you get that right, it's easy to do two, three, four, five. I think the biggest common pattern is they do one, then they do a second, the second one's not as good as the first, right? Then the first flat lines, then they do three, the second fails, first goes backwards, and third just, they can't raise any more money. And then it's game over. And I, I could probably write 20 examples of this, and then there's obviously a name on the other page that you saw that existed down the bottom called Fika, that is no longer here. It's finished. It was the Swedish Bluestone Lane and uh, they didn't get the cost structure right, and it's lights out, uh, <laughs> which is quite interesting because I got an email from their like, investment banker or managing the bankruptcy about three months ago. Adam and Amber probably got this. $18 million for FICA, and I was like, this is worth like zero. Like, oh, you should pay me to buy this. And then like a month later, they said, we'll give it to you for free. <laughs> it's a slippery slope. Um, okay. So what are the barriers of entry? So the uniformity of experience, right? It, you cannot be boutique at scale unless you have that uniformity. And the challenge is that the customer is so much more educated. They have so much more power. They know what's really good or not. I think that in Cafe Nero, what they did was just absolutely first class, and they really created this, you know, what they did in the UK and the consistency and winning all these awards. But the problem was, when they did it, people didn't have phones. And people couldn't, like, literally, asymmetrically denigrate you publicly. You get one thing wrong. They're going to tell everybody. It is extremely challenging to maintain that uniformity of experience. You also have this problem about, not a problem, you have the reality that people have so much more opportunity cost than they ever have. What does that mean? As a really simple example, you can work at Bluestone Lane, you have a, you have a set schedule, you have set breaks determined by the government. You have to wear a uniform, right? Because we are a brand, just like working if you worked in a Louis Vuitton store, or just like if you, you worked in a, in, in a hospital, you have to wear scrubs. Versus, right, all that rigidity and structure versus driving an Uber and determining when you want to drive. So you don't have to work today. I don't want to work today. It's, it's, it's foggy. I'll work tomorrow night. I'll do my three hours. That's the challenge that businesses have. Like they're trying to execute boutique, particularly because the type of staff that you typically want is college educated. Right? We're, not, we're not talking about employer of last resort. You're not going to be able to have pristine first class service that the customer now demands, especially if you do one really well or two really well. Now it's like every time it has to be that standard. Anything off slightly, that you're, you're, you've failed. You can't scale. <clears throat> so I think for us, like when we talk about talent, like if we can recruit, retain, develop uh, our people, we'll achieve something pretty significant. If we can't, doesn't matter about the coffee profile, doesn't matter about the real estate, the look and feel, the food innovation. If you can't get the people piece right, you can't achieve it. Because people pay, they go to these establishments right now for the service proposition. They truly do. If you don't believe that, then I tr my, my honest personal view is that it's just a matter of time before you're displaced for someone that is, has a cheaper cost structure, that can deliver quality without any personalization for far cheaper. Amazon could come in and do it. Google could come in and do it. This is exactly what these other industries have said. And uh, some of the technology that we're seeing is going gonna, is gonna to make that a reality. Um, I th I'm going to talk a bit about this customer advocacy and perception. Um, so let, let me just sort of explain for us. Um, we, we've always been quite innovative and willing to take some risks. So we went cashless in, in August 2016. We switched everything at once. We didn't offer Wi-Fi in our first 15 stores. Um, you know, we, we have some certain um, brand positioning that we feel is very important, and it challenges in some ways what the, the old guard have been doing. 
one of the biggest things is, is those two points that someone comes in, has a great coffee, they can't log on to the Wi-Fi, they give us a one star. Now, you would all think, oh, that's a bit unreasonable, it's not fair. You know, the coffee was good. Well, that's how I feel. But over the last five years, I've decided I can't feel like that because you can't win. You can't beat it. You cannot beat the customer advocacy forums because they are asymmetrical. There's no forum for like the owner saying, hey, you're a really terrible customer. I'm going to give you a star. Unless we want to go to, uh, oh, what's that? Oh, I, I saw it. It's on Netflix. Um, what's it called? Pardon? Black Mirror. That's the future. That's really scary. You, know, you can rate everybody. I would have rated your speech, Jeffrey, very highly. Um, and then, uh, you know, if you look at the power of Yelp, look at our referrals to our, to our website, right? Yelp Mobile, number one. Facebook, it's a bit, this is strange for October, Facebook number two, I don't know why, but it normally never is. And Yelp number three, normally it's Yelp, Yelp, Instagram. Isn't that extraordinary? Like, you spend all this time on Instagram and you spend all this time on Twitter, doesn't matter. Yelp. Yelp in the big urban cities drives behaviour. And we went to, we, had a t we were on a tech panel that Con Resnick hosted that does a lot of the, the finance and accounting work for the QSR brands in the US. And they said it's 10 to 15% impact on the top line if you've got four or five stars. So this is only accelerating. And people love the fact that they can go publicly and tell people anything they want without any consequence. Um, yeah, there's definitely going to be competition. Like Starbucks is definitely going to continue to ramp up this reserve. Whether you think it's good or not, it's definitely more elevated. I don't think it's like premium, but you know, it's definitely elevated. I think Blue Bottle and Nestle. You know, the thing I thought of, I th my view when the deal happened was that Nestle is not in retail. They'll shut this thing down, or they might do what they did with Nespresso in like high-end malls and things. But then I realised like no one's going to be in malls anymore, so they'll do something else on High Street. But from what I was told a couple of days ago by people who are definitely in the know is that Nestle is going to roll out 2,000 blue bottles. Like, this is real. And you know what gave it more validation was the fact that Coke bought Costa. Yes, it was a big play on Asia, the vending machine business and the market proposition, without a doubt. But to buy that many retail stores without a clear divestment policy right now or, or announcement means that I think a lot of the big guys are going to go into retail because that's how they can stay connected to the customer. Otherwise, they're going to have a purely offline bus uh, online business, which we all hear about now, is rapidly changing because no one can have that brand narrative and connection. So now anyone who is a D2C online business is now an omni-channel business, <laughs> which means brick and mortar. You know, you would have read about what Casper's doing, what Warby's doing, Glossier, right? The most successful of these cosmetic D2C brands is now going into brick and mortar. The thing that makes me feel good is at least like our brick and mortar's okay, so maybe we can, we can do the inverse and go to online. Um, this is really like the way that we think about Bluestone Lane. Bluestone Lane doesn't think of itself a, a, as a coffee company or a food company or, or a hospitality company. We are purely in the human connection game. And in fact, Schultz wrote about this very early on um, in, in the book. But the way I'd sum it up is like, we are, and our mission statement is to be our locals' genuine daily escape. It's a, it's a place in which they can feel recognised, that they can disconnect from their phone, hopefully, disconnect from society, where they can get some validation, they can get community. That's what people are looking for right now because they're spending so much time on digital devices, working virtually, working remotely, not interacting with humans anymore. And the fact that so many of our schools and our public figures are promoting STEM education could be extremely valid. But they're promoting purely IQ. And the IQ from, from, for the future is digital computer-based. It's computer screen and you where I think human, humans that real advantage in the future with the rise of you know, machine learning and AI is in the EQ game. So we're focusing on the EQ game and we're focusing on bringing humans together, right? Because you can't have living standards of the world being as high as they are right now, excluding the crisis in the Middle East, 
to have people feeling as lonely and rates of depression, you know, akin to great economic depressions. It's very strange. But that's what we're focused on. And I'll explain sort of, sort of why. But you can see there, um, efficient service, number one. Taste, number two. <clears throat> this sort of example of it, they talk about quality of product and the, and the coffee and, and uh, you know, as Jeffrey said with pour overs, it's sub-economic. We never ever had pour overs. Like we tried it I think for like two months at one location in Dumbo. It was the silliest decision. One, no one buys them. Two, um, the fact of the matter is you, it, you can't make any money. Like you just lose and I don't believe in running businesses where you can't be sustainable. I think that's just extraordinarily stupid as well. And so many people are doing this. They're like, it's, it's a vanity project. There's no rationale behind it. And when it all goes you know, pear-shaped, it's, it's soul-crushing. Um, so I'm a huge believer that human connection is the way forward, uh, that it's got to be absolutely unrelenting focus on premium and consistent food, coffee, tea, environment. But the most important thing and the thing that provides the biggest upside and really crystallise that special premium experience is also the element that's the most volatile. It's the thing you can't control. You can keep buying Lama Zocco machines. You can keep getting great real estate, especially in this market. You can build and design look schmick. But the service proposition you can't control unless you've got the right culture, unless you've got the right systems and you understand a clear playbook of who you are, what you are to your customer, and you're uh, unrelentingly, uh, relentlessly focused on it. So that's sort of it. The, the final thing I wanted to show is um, tech. So tech, in my eyes, is, is going to be exciting. It's going to try and, um, off, I would say, offset some of the cost pressure on the labor side. And the, the cost pressure on the labor side is absolutely extraordinary. Because if you look at minimum wage in New York, where it was like four years ago to, to January 1st, it's almost gone up 50%. Now, I don't think the cost of coffee has gone up 50%. And I don't think avocado smash is going to go up 50%. I think we're probably right at the stealing. Um, so tech, you've got to use to your advantage. So I'm not going to talk through it. But like this is how many sort of systems we have running in our business. And most of these are new. Because you'll implement something, and this is the, the problem, it's the dog chasing the tail. Every time you implement an embed tech, like your tech stack will change. And this is very frustrating because there's not too many, there's a, it's, it's quite fragmented and there's no one who's like got the best tech that is you know, transformatively better than anyone else. But um, you know, it just shows you like the amount of things that we're, we, we're putting in our business to try and drive greater controls, better understanding of the customer, of the experience um, and, you know, trying to make the business more efficient and powerful. So that's sort of...